Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's my great honor today uh, to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Melanie Matchett Wood. Um, I'm just going to say a very few words, and then we're going to hear some math. I first met Melanie when I uh, went to Duke to visit Dick Hain, and he told me, oh, I have this undergraduate who wants to talk about one of your papers, a paper about dessin d'enfant. And I was amazed that Melanie, who was then a college sophomore, was by far uh, the most deep and incisive reader that that paper ever had. Okay, honestly, almost one of the only readers that paper ever had, but still, it was very impressive. It was uh, um, for, for someone at her stage. Um, and, um, you know, Melanie went on from there uh, to do a PhD at Princeton with Manjul Bhargava, writing a wonderful paper. She sort of started out in this area of counting number fields, but sort of quickly branched out uh, into more general parts of arithmetic statistics while she was a postdoc at Stanford, uh, working with Ravi Vakil. Um, she wrote wonderful papers there. She wrote a wonderful paper with Daniel Ehrman, who also gave an invited address yesterday, and with Ravi, who's going to give a talk uh, in the current events bulletin later on. Um, just getting broader and broader and better and better and bringing more tools into her mathematical armament. Um, after that, uh, she came to be my colleague at the University of Wisconsin, um, and she also worked at some other colleges after that. Um, uh, Melanie, I mean, as you probably know, has like won just about every prize. Uh, she won a Packard. She won a, a, she won the Waterman Prize from the NSF, which is, if you know, is NSF wide, not just for math. And she won a MacArthur Fellowship. Um, but maybe you know, since I know Melanie very well, and since she works in the same area as me, um, maybe I'll just say, beyond the incredible technical power and beyond Melanie's ability just to sort of with apparent complete ease, just adopt completely new fields. And so we're going to hear today about uh, probability and three-manifold topology, which are not what I said that she works on, but she also does that. Um, but not only that, having you know worked with Melanie both as a collaborator and just as someone in the same field, um, to see the, the, the generosity and the influence with which Melanie does mathematics. I mean, just to sort of go to a conference with her and see sort of the crowd at the board and how she manages it and how much uh, people are getting from her ideas, um, I would really, I, it's really, I would really say that she is not just a prize winner. Uh, she's much more than that. She's a leader in a part of mathematics that I care a lot about. Um, and so it is really my great honor to introduce Melanie Matchett Wood to you. And now let's hear some math. Thank you, Jordan, uh, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, yeah, and so let's uh, get to uh, the math. So as Jordan mentioned, if someone said, well, what, what kind of mathematician is Melanie? People would probably call me a number theorist. And so um, uh, today I'm going to talk about probability theory and group theory and three manifolds. <laughs> so. Uh, if you, you manage to parse the title, congratulations. Uh, it's probability theory of groups, and it's going to be applied to three-dimensional manifolds. Um, and I'll start with the three manifolds and the question, and then eventually we'll see uh, how the probability theory for groups comes in uh, to the question about three manifolds. All right. Uh, so here's a starting question about three-dimensional manifolds, which I'll often, as I already have, call three manifolds, uh, just to, to be a little briefer. All right, so these three-dimensional manifolds, of course, they're topological spaces that locally look like R3, like the space around us. But if you, know, you go farther off, they might have more complicated um, topology. And specifically in this talk, I am going to be talking about orientable, compact, three-dimensional manifolds, true manifolds, but no boundary. Uh, and that capital M is always going to denote such a thing. So um, this talk will also have lots of examples. 
the theory that I ta will talk about is quite general. It, 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 it covers things in great generality, but I love examples, and it's a part of how I see the generality, and so I'm gonna share with you lots of, lots of examples just so we have concrete things in mind. So let's start with some simple examples of uh, three manifolds. So they're very hard to draw because we already live in only this three-dimensional space, especially uh, hard to draw on a board. But one nice three-manifold is if you take the circle, S1, the circle cross itself a couple times. If you do the circle cross the circle, you get the surface of a torus. I can draw that. And I can't really draw a great picture of the three-manifold here, but you imagine taking that torus and moving it around in a circle to cross it with a circle, and that is a compact, orientable three-manifold. Um, you could also take another uh, compact two-manifold, like S2, the surface of the three-dimensional ball. Um, so that is the, the two-dimensional surface there, and you could cross that with S1. Imagine bringing that around. Uh, that's another three-manifold. Also, S3, the boundary of the four-dimensional ball, that looks a lot like R3. It's like the three space that we live in and with just one point out at uh, infinity. So. The question that I'm gonna ask about these three-dimensional manifolds is about their fundamental groups. So this is the sort of one of the first uh, invariants we have in algebraic topology that helps us distinguish topological spaces. Uh, we write a pi one of m, the fundamental group. It's the group of loops in m up to homotopy under concatenation. So I've tried in this picture to draw two different loops around that surface of the torus, and these in the fundamental group are the same because you could slide one uh, to the other, but you could follow the red loop and then the blue loop, and that would be squaring that loop in the, in the fundamental group. So to every one of these three manifolds, we associate this fundamental group. For example, the fundamental group of our first example, S1 cross S1 cross S1, is Z cubed, and the fundamental group of the next example, S2 cross S1, is Z, and then the fundamental group of the three sphere is the trivial group. So I wrote one there for the trivial group. All right, so I've got these three manifolds. They each have a fundamental group, and we've seen some groups that can arise here, three different possible groups that might arise. And there has been a tremendous amount of amazing and deep mathematical work investigating all kinds of questions about what groups can arise as the fundamental group of three manifolds. And today I'm gonna to ask a question about, in that vein, but in a slightly different direction than um, what a lot of the, the, the um, past work has been about. And that question is what finite groups can be quotients of a pi one of M, a three manifold group, a fundamental group of a three manifold, in what combinations? All right, so I'm gonna make this question more precise on the next slide, especially what I mean by in what combinations. Um, but I wanna say a few things about motivation for uh, the question. Um, one is why am I asking about three manifolds? And there's, uh, th that's a more general question if, if you look in mathematics and there's so much work on three manifolds. Well, they, are, they occupy pi, this uh, amazing place in the theory uh, where at a lower dimension, one or two dimensions, things are understood very well and completely classified. And at four and higher dimensions, there's a great freedom in what is possible. Uh, for example, any finitely presented group can be the fundamental group of a, a four manifold. But at, at three dimensions, it's very complicated, but there is some limitation in structure. It's not everything. So three dimensions happens to be this magical place where there's a lot of interesting, non-trivial answers to questions about what the fundamental groups can look like. Um, and why do I ask what finite groups can be quotients? Well, on the one hand, it's just, it's, it's a natural group theoretic question. Uh, if you wanna know about a group, you might wanna know, does it have you know, S5 as a, as a quotient? Um, and I also have a number theoretic motivation that I think about analogies with number fields, and so to me, these are like asking, um, 
something that's analogous to, to inverse Galois flavor questions about the existence of number fields. And also, um, these, because of the relationship between the fundamental group and covering spaces, these finite groups that occur as quotients of the fundamental group have a special topological meaning. They are the deck transformation groups of finite covering spaces. So they are telling you something about what kind of covering spaces can um, three manifolds have. All right, so that's the, that's the flavor of the question about, um, about three-dimensional manifolds and their fundamental groups. So I'm gonna give you more examples and then I'm gonna make, as I promised, that question more precise. Okay, so here's another uh, more interesting example of one of these three manifolds. I'm gonna have to build it couple steps. So I'm gonna take two copies of HG. What I've drawn is actually H3. If you imagine it had G holes, it would be HG. Um, and this is a solid three-dimensional genus G handle body with boundary. So it's not a, a manifold that has this two-dimensional boundary. It's it not just the surface I'm talking about here, like the solid donut. You could take a bite out of it, it has a boundary. So these are two things that are both three manifolds with boundary. Um, but they have the exact same boundary, the exact same surface. And so I can topologically glue these together along their boundary via the identity map. Like you could imagine your little, little ant living inside of one of them, and whenever you get to that boundary, you're magically transported to the other one, uh, right, in that place of that boundary. And that gluing of the boundaries means that now, after this gluing, what I have is a genuine, uh, a genuine three manifold, and its fundamental group is the free group on G generators, and in this, with this picture, it would be on three generators, and those three loops are exactly what you would imagine. They're sort of going around the three holes uh, in, in the handle body. So, that means in particular that every finite group G is a quotient of some three manifold group because every finite group is the quotient of a free group on some number of generators. And so that explains why in my first slide I didn't ask what finite groups can be a quotient of a three manifold group because that uh, is a, a very simple answer. Um, but I ask about in what combinations. All right, so I'm now gonna give you another, another example. This is what I um, brought my dodecahedron here for. So the Poincaré homology sphere so we're gonna do a gluing to make this one, but instead of starting with two pieces, I'm gonna just start with one, a solid dodecahedron. Now, in, so you imagine that it's a three manifold inside and it has this two dimensional boundary. I wanna do a gluing and I wanna glue each face, like this blue face here, to the opposite face. So say gl glue this green face here to the opposite green face there. But as you can see in the picture, the faces don't line up perfectly. So uh, it's like I live inside of this dodecahedron. When I reach this yellow boundary, I get transported to this other side, but with a small twist, all right? So you do all of that gluing and you indeed make a, uh, a three manifold and it's um, fundamental group, it's called the binary icosahedral group. It also happens to be isomorphic to SL2F5. So this is a group of order 120. And it doesn't have so many finite quotients. Uh, it's almost simple here. The finite quotients are SL2F5, PSL2F5, and the trivial group. So we see some kind of like, oh, these three groups in combination uh, can be, be quotients of some three manifold. All right, so now, to make this question more precise from the last slide, I'll ask, given finite groups, G and H, so pick your two favorite or least favorite uh, finite groups, uh, is there a three manifold where its fundamental group has G as a quotient, but not H? Um, and so that's what this, in what combinations, uh, that's you know, one way to make precise what I mean, um, and, we can generalize this and we will, you could ask for some finite list of G and H. Well, you know, we think about one just to, to fix ideas, but um, the spirit of the question in what combinations is that, that given any finite list of groups that you 
um, one of three manifold that has these quotients and doesn't have these other quotients. Uh, we want to know if it's there. All right, so that is at least for every two finite groups uh, a uh, concrete question. It has a yes or no answer. I love questions like this, and then I want to know the answer. Uh, that, that is what really motivates me in mathematics, so I'm going to give you some answers. Um, uh, and so here's our question again, and so I'll give you some more or less obvious answers. So here's a, the, the thing is sometimes the answer is no and sometimes it's yes, it depends on G and H. Uh, so here is this very silly reason, but true, that the answer is sometimes no. If H is a quotient of G, then it's no. All right, okay, I said it was silly, but we, if you want the, all the answers, you have to include all the cases, okay. Here's a relatively easy yes. I could ask, is there a three manifold that has SL2, F5 as a quotient, but does not, of its fundamental group, uh, but does not have GL2, F5 as a quotient of its fundamental group? And, and why is that easy? We just saw one, yeah, it's this one, the Poincaré homology sphere. So yes, if you happen to know a three manifold, that uh, you, know, you can exhibit here. Its whole fundamental group was SL2F5, so it certainly doesn't have any bigger quotients. All right, so as you see, sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. Um, okay, so now um, I wanna give some less obvious answers, and uh, this work and then all the, m most of the theorems I'm going to, to talk about are uh, joint work with, with Will Sawin. okay, and so, uh, here are some, some examples of answers to, to this. Um, here's a no, and let me s s tell you the, the groups. If G is F3, so I'm writing F3 for the finite field with three elements, or you could think of it as Z mod 3Z. I just wanted a kind of compact way to write this group of order three. Um, and the reason I wrote it is F3 is gonna take SL2 F3. So I take F3 squared, this is like column vectors, uh, over the field of order three, and then I take a semi-direct product with SL2F3. Those act on F3 squared just the way you think they do, like multiplication of a matrix on a column vector. And this says, if that group G is a quotient of a three-manifold group, then H, now what is H? H is a similar group, but it's bigger. I have two copies of F3 squared, so this is like two by two matrices over F3. And SL2 F3 is just still acting in the same way you think, say by left multiplication. And that's a bigger group. Um, and this says if G is a quotient of a fundamental group of a th three manifold, then this bigger group H also has to be a quotient. So I hope that you agree that this is not as obvious <laughs> as the first no. Right? Um, all right, so that's, that is, is something that's true about three manifold groups. There is something special. They can't just stop at this group. They have to kind of expand uh, in some circumstances and, and be even bigger. Um, all right, and here are some uh, yes answers. It's actually gonna be a whole lot of yes answers uh, involving this group G which is, I take Z mod three cross Z mod five, so this is Z mod three is the same thing I call, called F3 up there, uh, the group of order three, and I'm acting in this semi-direct product by the quaternion group, QA to the quaternion group. The quaternion group, I take two different um, surjective homomorphisms to the group of order two, and I use those to act on, uh, and non-trivially on Z mod three and Z mod five, and that specifies a group here, a group of 100, order of 120. It's not the same as, as this binary icosahedral group. It's called a generalized quaternion group. All right, so that's the G. And what is the H gonna be? The H is gonna be whatever you want. So here is a result. For each N, there is a three manifold whose fundamental group has G as a quotient, but it has no other quotients of order up to N. And I had to put no other quotients in quotes, of course, because G itself has some quotients. So, except for the quotients of, of G. So, now, if I had told you about this, about this other group of order 120, the binary icosahedral group, the fundamental group of the Poincaré homology sphere, you'd say, well, yes, of course, because you have exhibited a fundamental group uh, of a three-manifold that's exactly G. But here, 
There is no such example. So this group is never the fundamental group of a three manifold. That is incredibly deep, relying on uh, Perlman's proof of, of geometrization, uh, which gives Thurston's um, elliptization and says that the, there's only a, certain, only a certain way that finite groups uh, can occur themselves as three manifold groups. So this yes is not for some easy uh, reason uh, or all these yeses. So there is something here where at least from this point of view of finite quotients, there are three manifolds whose fundamental groups look as close as you want <laughs> to being this generalized quaternion group, but none that ever, ever gets it on the nose. All right, so we give in, in our joint work um, a full answer to this question. We want to know this for all G and H, but as you can see, sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. You know, it turns out groups are, are, are complicated, so um, you have to organize the answer in some way, and here is how I'm gonna uh, organize the answer, and is our, our, our main way that we organize the answer in our paper. Um, we're gonna put a topology on the set of groups. So this is not a topology on a group, which you might, you know, you think of that all the time, but I'm gonna put a topology on the set of groups, and don't worry about set, okay? We can, Fine, isomorphism classes of finitely presented groups. So don't, don't, don't stress out about that. But where each point in the space corresponds to an isomorphism class of group. And then a basic open in this topology uh, are, is gonna be the set of groups that have G as a quotient but not H. I'm gonna make this an open for every finite G and H. So this is a topology that exactly captures what I care about in this, this question. And so then, in this language, what this problem turns into is to describe the closure of the fundamental group of three manifolds in this topology. You know, I want to know in every basic open, is there a, a point in there? And you can think about it, that's the, the same as knowing the, um, the closure of the set of, of fundamental groups of three manifolds. All right. Um, and here is a, uh, result that we give that describes this closure. Uh, and I don't want to go, we're, I'm not going to go um, too much into the, the details and parsing all this out. Mostly this is one of the benefits of slides. I just want to want you to see like there is a theorem. It's not impossible. Um, uh, um, and it tells when groups are in this closure in terms. So what is, what is it in terms of? A group, capital Pi, lies in this closure. If um, there exists something so that for each irreducible continuous, um, oh, I, you could ignore con continuous there, but um, uh, say the, if our, we're thinking of groups in the discrete topology, but if you wanted to add topological groups, you, you, you could just as well. Um, for each irreducible representation of that group over a finite field, and then there are some conditions. And what are these conditions about? Well, they kind of maybe depend on the type of representation like we see in number one. And then there's some dimension on the group cohomology, uh, some condition on the dimension of group cohomology. So this point one in the theorem, for example, is what implies that no that we saw. Remember on that last slide, there was this kind of funny no where if you had some G as a quotient, then you had to have this bigger group as a quotient. Where did that no come from? It's an immediate consequence of of point one in this theorem, all right? So this gives a, an answer to this question in terms of, of group cohomology, the sort of basic group theoretic uh, invariance. Um, and so what, um, so what goes into, into such a thing? Um, what does proving such a theorem entail? Understanding uh, the, the answers to these questions for every G and H, uh, is there a fundamental group with G as a quotient or not H, or this closure in this topology? Um, well, there are two directions. There's a sort of upper bound and a lower bound. So first of all, they're showing that these things are true 
well, there were these points, one, two, three, four, that had to be true, showing that they're true about the fundamental groups of three manifolds. If I'm claiming some criteria that cuts out the closure of the three manifold groups, uh, th then the three manifold groups need to be in that, in that set. Okay. So we show that those things are true. Um, uh, the first two of those four points are kind of interesting, especially the characteristic two representations one, um, and definitely new. And points three and four uh, follow from point gray duality and are quite simple, but you have to have them there because they're part of the description of the closure. And to prove that these things we use, even on points one and two, traditional tools from algebraic topology, cobordism, and some Euler characteristic computations of spaces, and um, and uh, and we show that these these criteria about the dimensions of group cohomology of irreducible representations over finite fields uh, are all true. They all are true for about th three manifold groups. But in some sense, then the question is: Well, you proved four things that are true about three manifold groups. Maybe there's like six more things like this that should be on your list. Like, yes, those things are true, but uh, you know, that's an upper bound. How do you know that that upper bound is sharp? So to prove that this is, in fact, exactly the closure, we have to somehow, um, uh, it, you know, prove this lower bound, create or construct or prove the existence of three manifolds otherwise. So for any finite G and H, if those criteria that I listed there don't prevent a group from having G as a quotient but not H, then we have to show there's an actual three manifold that has G as a quotient but not H. And we do that via a probabilistic method. So finally we're getting to the first half of the title. So we produce the three manifolds not by constructing them, um, but by studying a model of random three manifolds in which such a manifold occurs with positive probability. It might be exceedingly small positive probability. It might be like you'll never come across this three manifold in your entire life. It is so unlikely. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it gives us existence. And so this is um, in contrast to the sort of first point, the proof of the upper bound, this is a, a relatively new uh, approach to these kinds of, of, of topological questions. Um, however, the model uh, that we use is not, is not so new. Um, so Dunfield and Thurston in 2006 introduced the a model of a random Haggard splitting. So it's a way that we're gonna randomly produce three manifolds, and I will, I will tell you about it now. So remember, earlier on when we built that three manifold that had the free group as its fundamental group, we took our two solid handle bodies and we glued them together exactly along the identity map on their boundary. Well, these handle bodies, their surface, is the surface of genus G, and it turns out there are a lot of different ways you can identify a surface of genus G with itself besides the identity map. Um, and, for, and when you do that, you can get another way of gluing together the handle bodies in another three manifold. Such a thing is called a Haggard splitting of the three manifold. And since we care about, you know, up to homeomorphism, what kind of three manifold you get, the relevant thing, um, the relevant way to parameterize and talk about which maps uh, we want is the mapping class group of genus G. So this, this is a group that captures all the different ways uh, to map a surface of genus G onto itself. Um, and so this Dunfield-Thurston model says that we should take a random element of the mapping class group uh, and that use that to identify the surface boundaries of two copies of the handle body and then we'll get a random three manifold. And it turns out to not matter so much how exactly you take the random element of the mapping class group. I suggest you can, you know, there's lots of, of, of well-studied um, generators and you could take uh, a, a set of those generators and you could take a random walk in them that's very long and let the length of that random walk go to infinity. So 
um, it, yeah, it, it, the, everything turns out to be quite insensitive to how exactly you do this. So just imagine you've in some way taken a random way of gluing these two surfaces together. Um, and another important thing in this model is that one has to let G go to infinity. So all three-dimensional manifolds have a Hager splitting, so they appear this way when G is sufficiently large. But they might not all appear this way for, say, G equals three, as in my picture. So we're not only um, uh, you know, going to do this for one G, we're going to do this for arbitrarily large G and study what happens asymptotically as G goes to infinity. And what we actually do in our work um, with Will Solon is we, in this model, we find the distribution of the groups that arise as the fundamental groups of three manifolds in this model, and with a little hat over them. So what is the hat? The hat is the profinite completion. Now, if you don't know what a profinite completion is, it is the same as the data of exactly which finite quotients the group has and doesn't have. So just think of it, you, never in any of this are we studying other questions besides do you have this finite group as a quotient or not. Um, and of course, you can have two groups that are not isomorphic that have exactly the same finite quotients. Um, and from some groups, studying these profinite completions, like the set of finite quotients they have is not very interesting if they don't have very many finite quotients. But most of these three manifold groups have lots of finite quotients. Um, uh, and are what's called residually finite, which means every element uh, is non-trivial in some finite quotient. So finite quotients do see a lot of the, the three manifold groups. Um, and so Dunfield and Thurston had asked a bunch of questions about, well, how often does this happen or that happen in this model back in their 2006 paper? And there hadn't really been any tools to answer those questions. They were sort of beautiful questions about what happens in this natural model. Um, and we um, give a, a, a new approach by not just answering any particular question, um, but just saying entirely what distribution of groups do you get uh, in this model, which in particular answers, you know, we answer each of their specific questions about, well, how often does this happen? How often does that happen? You can read that off of our distribution of these groups. So uh, now I need to talk about these distributions of groups. So to get ourselves all in the same place, I'm going to start by just reviewing our common language that we share about distributions of numbers, which I think we're all much more familiar working with. So there are many well-known distributions of, of numbers. Here are two really important ones. Uh, the Poisson distributions, uh, the normal or Gaussian distribution. And so the Poisson distribution is a distribution, say, on the natural numbers. And how do we describe it? To describe such a distribution on the natural numbers, we give the probability that you're each number, right? What is the probability uh, in a, a Poisson distribution with some parameter that you get 0, 1, 2, et cetera? And so even though you might draw these lines connecting the dots, like the, the dots are really the Poisson distribution, not the line. Um, uh, conversely, that's not a good way to describe the normal distribution by telling you what the probability your any particular real number is. No. To describe the normal distribution, of course, we have to give probabilities of landing in certain intervals, basic opens. What's the probability that x is between a and b? All right? So these are, you know, so in the probability theory of numbers, as we all know, there are important distributions. There are different ways that we describe distributions depending on whether they're discrete or continuous. Um, and now, it turns out there is emerging theory of probability distributions of groups that will have many parallels. So I'm going to give you an example of a probability distribution um, on groups. So this is a probability distribution on finite abelian groups. Uh, and it is uh, first thought about by Cohen and Lindstrom. And in this distribution, the probability that your group is isomorphic to some particular finite abelian group is given by this explicit expression. Um, 
on the top, you have an infinite product which converges of inverse zeta values. That zeta is just the Riemann zeta function. That's just a number. Um, it's the same for, for every group. And then on the bottom, you have the size of the group and the size of the automorphism group of the group. And so this distribution was, um, was discussed by Cohen and Lindstra in the 80s, and they conjecture it up to some small issue at two to be the distribution of class groups of real quadratic fields. Um, and that is still vastly open to know such a thing, but it, it, it looks like what they've conjectured is likely to be true. And so they saw these finite abelian groups that were rising in number theory, and they wondered, well, what is this um, distribution on groups? And you see here, we've described it in this discrete way by for each group saying, well, what's the probability that you're this group and that group? And it turns out that those numbers, if you sum them up over all finite abelian groups, they sum to one. That was the reason, of course, for the choice of the numerator. So they would, would actually give a, a probability distribution. And this is actually um, a very important distribution in uh, the theory of probability distributions on finite abelian groups. And one reason for that is that it is universal, uh, analogous to how the normal or Gaussian distribution is universal in the central limit theorem. Remember, the central limit theorem tells us that um, if we build a random number by adding up identical independent copies of, uh, of, of basically any random number <laughs> and we appropriately normalize it, no matter what the input distribution on your original random number is, what you get out appropriately normalized is, is a normal distribution. And a similar thing happens to be true uh, for this distribution. So I'll just mention, this is a result of mine with Hoi Gwyn, um, that, so think about how might you build a, um, a random finite abelian group? Well, one way to do that would be to take um, uh, some generators and then some, make some random relations. And you can encode those relations as uh, their coefficients in a matrix. So if we let Mn be an integral n by n plus one matrix, whose entries are um, identically distributed independent copies of some random integer from any distribution. It could be like, well, I really like 17, so I'm gonna be 17 80% of the time, and I'll be negative 3.2% of the time. Every one of you could take a different distribution uh, for your random integer, and it turns out um, that for any uh, finite abelian group, the limiting probability that the random group that you would build from that matrix, uh, so it would be called the co-kernel of the matrix, it's what happens when you take z to the n and you quotient out by the image uh, of this, this matrix as a map on integral vectors, and you could also think of that as, as just uh, quotienting out n plus one relations where the coordinates of the relations are given by the matrix. So no matter what input distribution you use to build this random finite abelian group, the limiting probabilities will be this universal Cohen-Lenstra distribution. Um, so this is a little bit of a tangent from the point of uh, the talk, but I wanted to use it to get oriented in the probability theory of groups. It's not just that like, yes, sort of tautologically, you can make probability distributions by picking a bunch of numbers that add to one. There are, just as there are in probability distributions of numbers, real theorems and, uh, and distributions that are important and that arise naturally, and, uh, and this, is, this is one of them. Um, and, you'll, and, anyway, and you'll see some of these, these, these features uh, arise, some of the, these factors arise later. Now this is just about finite abelian groups. And so it turns out you know, that this is a distribution you can describe in this discrete way very well. Oh, I should have said, okay. I, there, I, I, you know, I alighted when I was reading it. You, of course, if your favorite random integer is zero 100% of the time, uh, this theorem is not gonna be true. So we ha you have to take it from a non-degenerate distribution, which means that it should be not constant mod p for any prime p. Um, uh, okay, so um, yeah, more probability distributions of groups. So now I'm going, to work a little harder to describe to you uh, a, a continuous 
uh, distribution here. So sometimes the probability of any particular group is going to be zero, and the way that you describe a distribution is giving probabilities on opens like we do with the normal distribution. All right, and I'm going to need to define a couple things uh, to um, give you an example of such a probability distribution. All right, so let's think about a word in formal variables. So for example, where you can take inverses, like A, B, A inverse, B inverse. A and B are formal, uh, and this is a word we all know well, the commutator of A and B. And I'm going to say that it is universally trivial in a group G if it's the identity whenever you replace the formal variables, in this case, say, A and B, with any elements from G. You know, you replace A by some element and B by some element. So for this example, this commutator word is universally trivial in a group if and only if the group is abelian. All right. But you could make lots of other words, and then you could ask if they are universally trivial in some particular group. All right. So let G and H be finite groups. And for group H, sorry, for group X, I'm going to make a construction, this thing in the box, this is the whole point of this slide, is I'm constructing this thing, X, G, H. It's going to be a quotient of X. And I'm going to take the quotient of X by all evaluations in X of all the words that are universally trivial in G and H. So I started with G and H. They have a bunch of words that are universally trivial. And, and I'm going to, to, to form a quotient of X by forcing all evaluations of these words that are trivial in G and H to be trivial in X. Now, um, for example, whatever G and H were, here is a, a word. Uh, if you take the order of G times the order of H copies of a, a, a variable A, that is definitely universally trivial in G and H. So that would be one of the many things that you would have to quotient out by. All right. Um, and so it turns out that for any finite group H in this topology on groups that I've described, the set of groups where their, their XGH, their GH quotient is isomorphic to, to F is, is open in this topology. And from XGH, this is the important thing, you can tell whether G and H are quotients of X. You know, the, my first question here was like, okay, I've got this G and H, I want to know when I have a group, can, is G a quotient but not H? Well, you can tell that from XGH because if the G or H was going to be a quotient, all of the words that are universally trivial in G and H were going to have to be trivial in that quotient, so it would have to factor through XGH. So XGH is like, this is the thing that we, w we can really focus our attention on for the question of whether G and H are, are quotients of X or not. Um, uh, all right. So uh, with that language, I'm going to be able to, to give a, you a, a general sense of what a probability distribution on, uh, on, on groups uh, might look like that's more continuous. And I'm going to give it to you by describing one case of what um, the, the distribution on the Dunfield and Thurston's random Hagrid splitting model looks like. So for finite groups G and H, in one case, so there's some sort of uh, finite list of cases. I'll say more about that at the end of this result, but this is sort of one case. The limiting probability is G goes to infinity that if you take the fundamental group of this Dunfield Thurston random Hagrid splitting, and then you just take the GH quotient, because I'm trying to figure out if this group has G as a quotient but not H, so I just want to look at the GH quotient. And remember, that's an open. So I now I'm sort of telling you about the probab that, 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 sorry, that the GH quotient is isomorphic to F. That is, a, is, is an open set, and I'm saying, well, what's the probability that you land in that open set? And in some case, uh, here, I'm going to give you an explicit formula. So it has a lot of factors. Um, you see there, here, the size of F comes in, like we saw in the cohen lenz distribution, and the size of the automorphism group of F. But you also see the sizes of a bunch of um, a group 
cohomology groups. So these are, some of these are not so mysterious. H1 is just the abelianization. The H2 is a very classical thing called the Schur multiplier. Okay, H3, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's the group, so these are, and sorry, I might have said group cohomology. These are the group homology the, with the H1 and 2 and 3 at the bottom there. Okay, so these are just basic group theoretic invariants of the groups. And then, times some more stuff, um, we get a sum over homomorphisms um, uh, from the third group cohomology into Q mod Z, and then a product of a bunch of terms over some things that are basically like irreducible representations of F. So we have a product over V of some, some stuff and a product over N of some stuff, and V and N range over the um, finitely many abelian in the case of V or non-abelian in the case of N, kernels of minimal non-trivial group extensions, E of F, uh, that are, are themselves under this GH quotient operation. Um, and so the Vs turn out to be, they have to be irreducible representations of the group F over finite fields. And the N are like the analog of that, like an irreducible representation, but you replace Z mod PZ with a non-abelian simple group. Okay, so they're sort of like abelian and non-abelian irreducible representations. But they're not all of the um, representations. They're the only the ones that are kind of somehow just about G and H. Uh, that's what this EGH equals E condition is, just about G and H. And you see, you know, you don't have to parse everything here. I just wanted you to see that the terms are not that mysterious. You know, you've got again now a group cohomology group and you're taking some invariance of it. I'm, I'm talking about like the, the, the exponent in the far right. That Z is just a centralizer in the outer automorphism group. So none of these things are, are kind of crazy. They're all just your know, basic invariance of groups and how they operate. And I mentioned, this is in one case, this is when these representations V are unitary, um, for example, and there are different formulas in other cases, like for different kinds of representations. But we give a big chart of what the appropriate terms look like in each of the cases. Um, uh, and they all look cosmetically similar, and th th they don't, you know, this is the, the th kind of things they depend on, except that sometimes the factor is zero. Sometimes it's zero. So sometimes you get this, and this, you can note, is explicitly a positive number. This is a, this is a positive number. So this tells you that there are three manifolds whose fundamental group has GH quotient F in this case when this number is positive. But in some other cases, depending on whether, whether F might have some irreducible representations of another kind, then the, the formula will be, will be just zero. And we, we, we find this, and so this is what I mean by saying we give the, the distribution of the fundamental groups of three manifolds from this random Haggard splitting uh, model, we describe it uh, by, um, by these explicit probabilities. And even if they have a lot of terms, um, uh, it can help you answer a lot of questions about these distributions. And for example, uh, if you want an existence result and you have a bunch of complicated terms that multiply to a positive number, uh, you, you certainly get an existence result. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about how we get to, uh, get to such a result. Um, and to do that, uh, we use moments. So I will just very briefly recall that in the probability theory of distributions of numbers, this is a very important tool to recognize distributions from the, their moments. Uh, so the moments of distributions of numbers are indexed by the natural numbers, and the kth moment is the average of x to the k over the distribution. You might write it as an integral, or if you're more probabilist, it's the expected value of your random variable, the kth power of your random variable. And so these distributions we talked about before, um, they have uh, a very well-known kth moments for every k, and it's a little more convenient to write them down a little normalized here. They're centered, and here they're the falling moments, but these are equivalent in terms of uh, the information is telling you what, what the moments are. 
And in fact, uh, many times, the way one can recognize in some problem that you're seeing a normal distribution or a Poisson distribution is because you see, oh look, it has exactly these moments. Okay, so it must be normal or must be Poisson. So as, as long as the moments as a function of k don't grow too fast, uh, then there's at most one distribution with those moments, and I won't want to get into details about it too fast, but here's a, you can be like e to the k, so you can grow exponentially, just not exponential in a, in a quadratic. Um, and this is a very common way that uh, we, we recognize distributions of numbers is through these, these signature moments. Um, and this, you know, um, work one of, is part of a lot of recent work where we're bringing the probability theory of the moment method to probability distributions on groups. And there is a long history of doing this in uh, different kinds of examples in, in number theory, where one cared about things like distributions of summer groups or class groups, uh, going back to work of Heath Brown and Fugby Kluders, who were doing this for distributions on F2 vector spaces, uh, and work of Ellenberg, Venkatesh, Westerlin, and myself on uh, more general finite abelian groups, uh, work of mine with, with Boston, and work so in uh, going into non-abelian groups. Um, and in all of this setting and in the, the, you know, this new work, these moments, what are these moments? Well, they're not indexed anymore by natural numbers. They're indexed by finite groups K. And they are the average uh, of the number of surjective group homomorphisms from your random group to some fixed group K. So they're still a number. The moment is still a number. You get one of them not for every natural number K, but for every finite group K. Um, uh, so for example, for this cohen linster distribution I described, for uh, every um, finite abelian k, the kth moment is, uh, is, is k inverse. So that is how you can recognize when you have this cohen linster distribution. And for the Dunfield-Thurston distribution, this is the formula for the moments involving uh, the size of the group and these two group homology groups, which are just the Schur multiplier and the abelianization. And so in joint work with Solomon, we have shown that moments determine um, distributions not just for groups, but in a very general categorical setting uh, where groups could be replaced by modules or rings or, okay, even crazier things like quasi-groups, Lie algebras, graphs, all sorts, of, um, all sorts of things. And we actually do this because for technical reasons, one needs to work in a little more complicated categories, even in the three-manifold case. Um, we don't work in the category of groups, we work in the category of pairs, G, S, where G is a group and S is an element of the third group homology of the group. That kind of comes from the fundamental class of the three manifold. So to flexibly do this, one has to be able to, to work in, in, in more general settings. And this work on the moment problem has been the big, um, the big push that has helped us understand this distribution. So um, in the previous work, all the previous work I mentioned, it used moments to recognize an already known distribution. Like, oh, I, I, we already knew about the cohen linster distribution, it had those moments, so I see the moments, I know, yep, cohen linster distribution. But in th this case, we had to do something different uh, and we give explicit formulas for distributions in terms of moments. So from starting with these numbers here, nobody knew a distribution that had these moments. And actually we worked and tried to come up with such a distribution, just, you know, spitballing and could not come up with a distribution. But what we have created is theorems and um, a whole general theory that allows you to go from these numbers, these averages, to produce explicit descriptions of the distribution, like these formulas. So that big arrow there, going from the moments to the distribution, um, that has been the big theoretical advance, and um, I think about as sort of doing analysis on the space of groups, and some of that goes back also to my work with Yuan Liu. Um, and then, you know, once you have those formulas and you can look at them and uh, see when they're zero or not, 
That is what in the end gives us the existence of a three manifold with G as a quotient but not H every time it exists. And when it doesn't exist, it turns out the probability uh, is zero. That's not enough to prove it doesn't exist, but we also prove it doesn't exist. All right, thank you. Okay, Melanie, thanks so much. And um, Michelle, I can't see the time, so how long do we have to do questions? It, it, 10, okay, great. So it falls to me to manage questions. Um, if you want to ask something, as you can see, there's microphones right where I'm pointing, and I would ask you to uh, walk up to them and address your question to Melanie. Oh. Hi, Melanie. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Like I just learned so many things from so many different fields. It's great. Uh, uh, so I'm, uh, I love things about probabilistic method because it's always so magical, and it always makes me want to understand uh, what about this problem uh, uh, might suggest that a probabilistic method is helpful. Like uh, in, in my very naive understanding, a, uh, it's useful to consider the a large space of groups instead of a single group when there is some sort of cancellation between between all of the different groups that produces a nice formula like this moment, uh, perhaps. Like, is, is that true in this situation? Or, or is there another reason why probabilistic method is good here? Yes, that's a great, um, a great question, sort of why, why the probabilistic have method happens to work. I mean, there is a great miracle that I cannot explain uh, that I alluded to at the very end, which is um, sometimes the formula that one gets in various cases is zero. And it turns out, it just so happens in all of those cases, we can prove by completely separate means that there are no three manifolds you know, in, that, in that open uh, set. And so, that didn't have to happen, and I don't know why it happened. If it hadn't happened, this would not have worked. Um, uh, so I think that's a very interesting philosophical question. I mean, it happens in other problems too, but to understand somehow why things um, uh, fit so um, well. I mean, I think in this case, um, it is not so hard to see these moments, these averages. Like you can see, well, how often do you on average um, uh, see that you get a particular group as, as a finite quotient? And so, I mean, the thing that suggested us to hear that this could work was that we're sort of building this theory that says, well, from those averages, you should be able to describe um, uh, the distribution. So, um, yeah, so I, I think it's, you know, it's not easy to say in general when a probabilistic method would work, but you can sort of think from your probabilistic model, what are the kinds of things that you can get out plausibly? And then I think, um, you know, especially if you're working in some particular field, you use your method, say, from topology to get these moments, and then, um, you might want to ask, well, what can probability theory do for me? What can it tell from the things that I already can understand? What can probability theory lift them to? I think that's the kind of attitude to, to take. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I guess we'll have a question over here, yeah. All right, um, thank you, Melanie, for, this, uh, for giving this really awesome talk. Now, um, one of the example distributions that you gave earlier was um, the Cohen Lenstra distribution for real quadratic fields, which mm -hmm. involved having um, both the size of the automorphism group yep. as well as the size of the group itself in the denominator. And I guess if I remember correctly, for the imaginary quadratic fields, well, the distribution just involves the size of the, um, of the uh, automorphism group. And well, I suppose um, my question then is, um, I guess what, what, what sort of things do you see and say the moment, what sort of different things do you see in the moments uh, for these different 
um, distributions which turn out to involve certain things and not other things like, you know, like factors of automorphism groups or the sizes of the groups themselves or these various um, group uh, cohomologies, right? Um, yeah, um, well, I think that we're just beginning to explore the, the world. So certainly in, in number theoretic applications, you know, we see um, sizes of groups and automorphism groups. If there is extra structure on the group, like it has a pairing or it has a special element or it has a special subgroup, then often the automorphisms of the group with that extra structure are what actually uh, come into the formulas. Um, and we see, um, you know, um, if, the, if the group has an action of some other group, you might want, you know, automorphisms that are equivariant for that action. Um, yeah, you know, sizes of groups and of, of um, when they're abelian groups, some various tensor powers of them come in. Uh, but, you know, I think that, that there is a lot more to be discovered and we will see, you know, we will see interesting distributions that involve other, uh, you know, natural group theoretic quantities as well. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning that, or not, maybe not at the beginning, but that the sort of distribution on the mapping class group that you start with doesn't really matter. Is mm -hmm. that mean that this is sort of like a universality statement? Yes. And also yeah. the moments, are those the moments of the sort of limiting distribution, I assume? Yes, so those, okay. those are the moments as, as G goes to infinity. Okay. And in fact, I slipped that under the rug, but part of what we prove is that there is a limiting distribution. Right. You know, just because I give you a sequence of distributions, it doesn't have to have a limiting distribution. There is a limiting distribution, we prove. It has uh, those moments and probabilities like in those formulas. And yes, so there is a sense in which this is universal. I'd like to see much greater universality and would conjecture much broader universality, but this is absolutely universal in the sense that you could put a, a totally different um, distributions on your uh, random walk in the mapping class group and you get exactly these same, you know, probabilities that are insensitive to that. And so that's the sort of start of seeing that this is a universal distribution, but I would conjecture it's much more universal than that, that you could, you know, that if you construct three manifolds in other ways that don't uh, obviously have additional structure, like they're not fibering over S1 by construction or something, I would expect to see this kind of distribution on their um, fundamental group. Thank you. So you yes. mentioned near the beginning that one of your motivations to study questions like this was the inverse Galois problem. Is there any hope that probabilistic techniques like this, maybe with some interesting distribution on number fields, could tell us anything about that? Yeah, that's a lovely question. Um, I, yes, I, I uh, yeah, I think that is a great question. I mean, I think that that's, um, part of a very long-term kind of dream in, in building these kinds of things up. There's certainly not any approach that I would say, oh, we could go try that now. But I think um, a part of the reason one wants to build up uh, these tools would be um, to apply them in other cases like that. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Thank you. Okay, so I think I, I can see the Peter Winkler fans starting to push their way <laughs> in the doors. So uh, Melanie is going to be available in 204 to chat further. I know that there's people who are still lined up, and I have some questions too, actually, but I didn't want to line up behind the microwave. So, uh, the, uh, so uh, thank you again for coming, and let's thank Melanie one more time for a fantastic talk.